last time we talked about uh, the thermal conductivity and the thermal diffusivity. On the board, these are notes from the first lecture since I teach three back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back classes. I don't always erase everything. I save some, so we'll get to this later, okay, so hang on for that. Okay, chapter two is the shortest chapter in the textbook. Uh, we'll finish it probably early Friday lecture and start chapter three on Friday. What we're going to do first is show you how you would find the thermal conductivity of various substances in the back of the book in the appendices. So we start off by uh, looking at the tables A. And let's put table A1 here. Okay, so our first table is table A1. Metallics. Oh, maybe aluminum, maybe copper, and of course, many, many more. The table is arranged First of all, it has, uh, I think, the density. Let me double check the back of the book and make sure I get these guys right. Here we are. <clears throat> yeah, rho, C sub P, K, and alpha. All these guys here are at 300 K, typical ambient temperature. Now beyond that point, we have K as a function of temperature. So there'll be K at 300, 350, 400, 450, 500, and so on. K is a, could be a, a, a strong function of, of temperature. Density is not. C sub P, no. So they don't give how C sub P and rho vary with temperature. They give how K varies with temperature on the right-hand side of table A1. Um, table A2. Table A2, non-metallics. In table A2, oh, aluminum oxide, carbon, diamonds, graphite, things like that. Format similar to table one. Okay, just as a word of caution about reading table A1 and even A2, for pure aluminum, alpha 97.1. So don't, don't get this confused. Uh, this doesn't mean alpha equal 97.1 times 10 to the 6. It means alpha times 10 to the 6 equal 97.1. So alpha equal 97.1 times 10 to the minus 6. This is no, this is yes. Y you'll know, you'll be off by a quadrillion, okay? You say, my gosh, my answer is so small compared to yours. Yeah, because you didn't, you didn't read the table correctly. So that's, that's what the author does. Some books do it differently. The author's a dealer, dealer's choice. That's the way he presents the ta table material. 
Okay, now, um, that's the first two tables. Let's go to table A3. Table A3, there's four parts to it. By the way, uh, pretty much table A3 is not as lengthy as table A1 and 2. Uh, they give you density, K, and CP. So, first column, they call it composition, so we'll call it a description, we'll just call it description. Or we'll call it material, that's okay. Uh, row CP K. And they're all, all at 300. You have no choice. That's just what it is in the book. So the first part of that table is titled Structural Building Materials. Okay, the uh, second part, Insulation Systems. The third part, industrial insulations. The fourth part is others. So four parts, they all look like this. Density, C sub P, K. They're all at 300 except one of them has a range of temperatures, but the other three are just at all 300 degrees K. So if you look at the first part of table A3, structural building materials, like what? Okay, <clears throat> plywood, acoustical tile, out here, acoustical tile. Hardboard, particle board, hardwood, oak and maple, softwood, fir and pine. Brick, what kind of brick? Common brick, face brick, tile, what kind of tile? Hollow tile, concrete blocks. So those are all under structural building materials. Then comes insulations, pretty much insulations you'd find in buildings, okay. For instance, fiberglass, we talked about that last time, fiberglass. Cellular glass, polystyrene, either beads or extruded. Cork, dimitaceous silica, vermiculite fibers. All those kinds of insulations are in table A3 here. Now, industrial insulations, a power plant, an oil refinery, a chemical plant. Okay. Mineral fiber blankets, aluminum silica fiber blankets, felt, pipe insulations, board insulation, block insulations, calcium silicate insulation, cellular glass insulation, polystyrene, rubber, mineral fiber, cellulose, paper pulp, all those are in that table on industrial insulations. Then we go to the last one. Now, if you get something on a problem, whether it be homework or an exam, and you have the tables, and by the way, I've put these tables on the Blackboard website under documents, and it's in a package called the data package for the class. You'll get a copy of this data package for every exam. I'll pass them out before the exam. I'll collect them back after the exam. But you'll know what you're going to get during the exam because you can look at it on the Blackboard website now. There's a lot of tables on the Blackboard website, but there's also these tables on the Blackboard website under documents called the data package. So 
you have that now. Um, others, if you can't find the material in table A1 or A2 or structural building materials or insulations or industrial insulations, look here. Maybe you'll find it there. Like what? Okay, I'll read a few. Asphalt, streets and walkways out there. Brick, what kind of brick? Carborundum brick, chrome brick, dimitaceous silica brick, fire clay brick, magnesite bricks, all kind of bricks. Clay, coal, concrete, cotton, plate glass, pyrex glass, ice, leather for shoe soles, paper, paraffin, granite rock, limestone, marble, quartzite, sandstone, rubber, hard, soft, sand, soil, snow, Teflon, wood, they're all in there, okay. Human tissue, skin, fat layer, muscle, it's in there, K value. All done experimentally, experimentally. You have banana for breakfast? Oh, it's in here. K banana? Say, who in the world? I don't know. K of a banana. Why should I care about that? Well, we'll think about it. Red apple. Cake batter. Cake fully baked. Chicken meat white. Oh, yeah. It's all in there. They did it experimentally. Why? Oh, foodborne illnesses. Food safety. Food safety. How long should I keep? that burger on the grill at your favorite burger stop to make sure it's safe to eat. Give me a time, because the guys there don't know the time. The guys in finance don't know the time. No, no, guess who does that? Uh, me, you, mechanical engineers. We tell them how long it should be in there. The turkey in the oven. The vegetables and fruits going from South America to here under refrigeration. They need to know the K values, bananas and grapes and blah, blah, blah. Beef, what percent fat, da 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 da, turkey, chicken, you name it, fish, all food safety done by us. So, yeah, it comes under others, yeah, others. If you can't find it here, look there as your last choice. It's probably there, you'll probably find it there. Okay, let's go on. These are all solids. Last time we talked about the K value of solids, liquids, and gases. Solids. A4. Gases. Here are the columns, okay? The gases. For instance, there's eight of them given there. These are only four. Air, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. Okay. Rho, Cp, mu, absolute viscosity. Nu, kinematic viscosity. You're going to need to find the Reynolds number in convection. You need the viscosity to find the Reynolds number. K, alpha. C sub P. C sub P. If you go to that table, oh, liquid's the same way, okay? Liquid's the same way. Rho, C sub P, mu, nu, K, alpha. Same thing, both tables. Uh, fluids like this. Refrigerants. Engine oil and several others, probably six or eight other fluids given, liquids given to you there in that table. But be careful, be awfully careful. Let's go over here. C sub P, joules per kilogram K. Over here, C sub P, joules per kilogram K. Down here, C sub P, joules per kilogram K. Go over here, ooh. Kilojoules per kilogram K. And I will tell you, under stress of an exam, somebody's going to go here and they're going to put in the equation for C sub P 505 because they didn't see the letter K. No, it's 505,000. So be careful of things like that. Small mistakes can be big penalties for you on homework and exams, especially exams. Be careful. They changed the units of C sub P among the tables. Okay, so now that gets us to the last one, which, because 
table A5 liquids doesn't have water in it. So there's a special table for water. So it's different. There's what's in that table. Temperature is left-hand column and all that string of things there. So you gotta know there's two values of K. Kf and Kg. You gotta go back to your thermal background. Let's see now. That table's titled not water, titled saturated water. Give me that bottle right there, will you? You want to impress your friend and say, you thirsty? You want some of my saturated water? The guy says, what's wrong with it? What do you mean saturated water? I want plain water. That's okay, they're good people, I love them, you know. It's just they don't maybe know the word what it means, saturated water. Because it can be a saturated vapor or a saturated liquid. So when you go to that table, we're not talking about steam in a pipe, we're talking about water, liquid water. G, gaseous phase, F, liquid phase. You use everything with an F subscript on the table, nothing with a G subscript for saturated liquid water. Saturated liquid water. Okay, so just a warning so you know. When you see these guys, don't look at him, that guy. This table, density, 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 no, thermo, okay? Density is one over little v. Density is one over specific volume. Density is one over little v. You've got the density, it's just in the thermo table, that's all. Okay, so yeah, there are some little things to be careful of reading the tables, that's why I spend class time going over it. But there they are, everything you need in this class for this book is in those properties, solids, liquids, gases. Okay, now that gets us to the last part of chapter two. That's not very technical. The last part of chapter two, oh yeah, now we get to the technical stuff, okay. The last part talks about the most important equation in conduction heat transfer. That equation is called the heat diffusion equation. Heat diffusion. Heat diffuses in the solid by conduction. It's the most important equation in conduction heat transfer. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, sure. The fourth characteristic of your Which one now? Yeah, yeah. I, I just didn't want to put double, yeah. C sub P, F, C sub B, G. Right, oh, right. It'll have in the book. Yeah. Okay. So, we, let's just take a solid, for instance, take a solid. We take a small differential element in the solid. The differential element has dimensions dx, dy. We're going to do this in two dimensions, not three. So the z dimension comes out of the board towards you. We assume it's unit length, unit length one in, out of the board. We're looking at an energy balance on this element. So we have energy coming in, energy going out, and things happening inside. Energy is transferred in by conduction. So Qx is conduction coming in the left-hand face. Chapter one, Q in the x direction, K times the area times dt dx, the partial because the temperature is a function of x and y, and also t time. So there it is, minus K A D T D X. <clears throat> the area, as we said before, if the heat flow is horizontal, the correct area is the area normal to the heat flow, my hand. The area for QX is normal to the direction of QX. This area right here, it's dy high times one into the blackboard or out of the blackboard, dy1. Similarly, at the bottom, coming in the bottom, we assume conduction, qy, okay, qy, minus chapter one, Fourier's law, 
minus k a d t d y. The appropriate area. The area is normal to the heat flow. The heat flow is vertical. The correct area is the area of my hand. dx times 1. The heat that goes out the right hand face. Continuous function, we expand it into a series. We take the first two terms in the series. Qx plus dx equal Qx plus the partial with respect to x of Qx times dx. Should be dx there. This should be a dy. Qy coming in the bottom. Qy plus dy going out the top. Out the top. Qy plus dy. What comes in the bottom? Qy plus the partial with respect to y. Qy times dy. Substitute in for Qx this term. Substitute in for Qy this term. Okay. E dot g. E dot g is the rate at which energy is generated inside the small control volume. We express that in terms of something called Q dot. Q dot is the energy generation per unit volume, watts per cubic meter. So if we want that to be in watts, we multiply that by the volume. The volume of this element is dx times dy times 1. This is the volume. So now we've got a Q dot. Let's go over here and review our Qs. Okay, so far we're in chapter 2. Here they are. Q, Q prime, Q double prime, Q dot. Give me a name. The heat rate or heat transfer, Q. No name, that's watts per meter. Heat flux, energy generation rate per unit volume, Q dot. There's also going to be later on, chapter 5, a capital Q. Capital Q. Capital Q is energy. Little q is a power term, watts. Capital, uh, capital Q is energy. It's going to be in joules. Energy is joules. Power is watts. A watt's a joule per second. Okay. Okay. Now we also have possibility of storage in that little element. Okay. Here's what storage is. In general, simplistic terms, mc sub p delta t. mc sub p delta t. The dot means per time. Okay. mc sub p partial t with respect to time. Check the units. Make sure they're always check the units. You don't want to make a mistake and have it caused by incorrect units. That's downright embarrassing because the first thing you're taught to do in engineering is always check the units in the equation and make sure they check. Everything better be in watts. I know that's in watts. I know that's in watts. I just told you that's in watts. Check this guy. Mass kilograms, C sub P joules per kilogram K, temperature K, time seconds, cancel, 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 joule per second, watts. Yep, that's okay. Okay, so every term in there is in watts. Now, we look at the energy balance for that differential control volume. This is chapter one, the last part of chapter one. Okay. Energy balance for a control volume. E dot in minus E dot out plus E dot gen equal E dot storage. What comes in is Qx and Qy from my picture. Those arrows come in. Qx plus Qy in. What goes out? X plus dx, Qy plus dy. There they are, minus, minus. Plus E dot gen, put in there for that. E dot storage, uh, this is storage, gen is up here. Go through, there's about mm, maybe maximum three lines of just reducing that down to a 
easier format. And when you're done with that reduction, the equation is a partial differential equation. should be second partial. Let's put the, let's put the K inside for right now. Yeah, let's put the K inside. We'll put the K inside. Uh, plus Q dot equal rho CP DT D time. So you can see there's k dt dx, k dt dx. There's a partial with respect to x there. There's k dt dy, there's k dt dy. There's a partial with respect to y. You can, it kind of follows fairly easily. Here's a dy, here's a dx, here's a dx, here's a dy. Here's a dx, here's a dy. What's the mass? Density times the volume. What's the volume? Here's a dx, dy. My conclusion is every term has in it a dx, dy. I'm going to divide through by dx, dy. That's why you don't see the dx and dy here, because every term has the dx and dy in it, and you divide through by the dx, dy, and it goes, different, gone. Okay. Now, I'm going to, the typical assumption made now is uh, let k be a constant. Pull k outside there and divide through by k. Pull k outside, pull k outside, divide through by k. That's a two-dimensional form of the heat diffusion equation. Two dimensions means only x and y. This is equation 219 in the textbook. It, the one in the textbook has the z term in it too. It's a three-dimensional form, that's okay. We're gonna only focus on the two-dimensional form in this class. Uh, but recall, last time we met, alpha was defined as k over rho cp. Okay, there it is right there. So that gives d squared t dx squared, d squared t dy squared plus q dot over k equal one over alpha dt d time. That makes it a little cleaner, neater looking. 
and we replace K rho Cp by one constant called alpha, the thermal diffusivity. Of course, you can reduce the equation down any way you want. Give me some assumptions. Okay, one-dimensional, fine, that term goes out. Tell me the problem, there's no generation, fine, that term goes out. Tell me the problem is steady state, fine, that term goes out. So if steady state, nothing varies with time, steady state, and no gen, then d squared t dx squared d squared t dy squared equals zero. Famous Laplace equation. Now, the object uh, is to find how the temperature varies with x, y, and time in this case because the general heat diffusion equation has the partial with respect to x, the partial with respect to y, the partial with respect to t, x, y, t. Once I get that solved, we're going to see it's very straightforward to get the heat transfer. But to get the heat transfer, and that's the object, to get the heat transfer, the first step is to find the temperature distribution in the object. I don't care if it's rectangular, cylindrical, or spherical. Oh, by the way, um, let me put a note here. If cylindrical, in the textbook, that equation is 226. If it's spherical, The spherical heat diffusion equation is equation 229. So you have three forms of the heat diffusion equation. One rectangular, this guy. One spherical, one cylindrical. Okay, we're going to focus on the rectangular two-dimensional form right now though, the boxed equation. Okay, so the object is to find temperature as a function of x, y, and t. To do that, I need initial conditions and boundary conditions. So, for the initial condition, I see. T or any wet X, for instance, any, let's just, let's just, I'll use this way. X, uh, let's just use, yeah, X, Y, T equals zero is equal to T. Let's see what our textbook call that. He called it TS. That means at time equals zero, the temperature everywhere in the object is temperature Ts. So that's the initial condition. For the boundary conditions, Bc, Bc. Table 2, 2. Okay, the first one was titled 
constant surface temperature. I'm just going to use the x coordinate now. I don't want to carry too many variables. So that would say the temperature at the location x equals zero, which is the surface, for any time would be equal to uh, given, I think they call that T1 maybe. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Excuse me. This was called TI. Got ahead of myself. That's T initial right there. This is TS. The S stands for surface, the I stands for initial. So maybe we're looking at this concrete wall. And I don't know, it's eight centimeters thick, something like that. I'm measuring X from here out into the hall. X goes that way. This is X equals zero. So my initial condition might be, uh, at time equals zero, this wall is pretty much at the same temperature, I'll say 72 degrees Fahrenheit. My boundary condition then is suddenly I change the temperature of the wall to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a constant surface temperature boundary condition. Okay, that's the first one. The second one is constant surface heat flux. That's Q S double prime. So it's constant. Q S double prime is equal to minus K dt dx at x equals zero. So Here's the wall. Here's the heat flux coming in. And here's what goes out. This is a surface energy balance here. What comes in to the surface goes into the object by conduction. This is conduction, Fourier's law, chapter one. This is a heat flux hitting the wall. So now my boundary condition is, at time equals zero, I'm going to shine a heat lamp on that wall. And that heat lamp is putting out so many watts per square meter. Or I attach a plate heater like this to the wall, take the two leads coming out, put it across a power supply, and put heat into that heater. This is the heater you can buy, plate heaters. And that plate heater puts out so many watts per square meter. Q S double prime. Or maybe you want to model a parabolic trough solar collector. Here's a tube carrying oil or water. Here comes the sun's energy. Point the collector to the sun. Hits this here. Hits this here. Hits this here. Hits this here. Hits that there. Oh, you almost get a uniform heat flux on the tube from the sun. Yeah, you can roughly model it like that. Yeah. So there's many applications in the real world which correspond to this. Sometimes they wrap heaters around a pipe. If they're worried about the temperature of the fluid in there, especially, well, I'll give you an example. The solar collector field here carries oil out to the collectors. And then at night, the oil, they turn the collectors off. It's before sunset, obviously. So the oil is sitting out there uh, all night long. And in Southern California, typically they're in the high desert. And the nights up there, oh, it can, get, it can get freezing. Oil gets really cold. What you don't want to do is turn those pumps on in the morning with cold oil. Ooh, the viscosity is really big. Not good. 
So they trickle electrical energy. They cover this with insulation, of course. And they trickle electrical energy along the pipe to keep the oil from getting too cold. So when they turn the pumps on in the morning, the oil is not, the pumps aren't fighting real cold oil. So yeah, they, there's all kinds of applications of, of this condition. Let's take number four. I'm going to do it right here. Okay, number four is if the surface is perfectly insulated. Uh, number three, pardon me, number three, perfectly insulated. That means that the surface heat flux is zero. There, there, it's insulated. No heat gets across that boundary. So in that case, just replace in condition two, replace the QS double prime with zero. So D, T, D, X at the location, I'm assuming X equals zero, whatever it is, is zero. That's the one you use for an adiabatic, well, by the way, perfectly insulated, the word is adiabatic. That's the official word. Just because something's insulated doesn't mean it's perfectly insulated. I can put insulation on pipes in my attic to keep the hot water lines warm, but it's not perfect. But the model is, if it's very close to being perfect, we call that surface an adiabatic surface. Then we have four. Four is convection on the boundary. I blow a fan against that wall, a big floor fan against that wall. Yep, that's convection on the wall. It's not constant surface temperature, it's not constant heat flux, it's convection on the wall. Okay, well, I know, here's my picture again. Convection. When it gets to the wall, how does it get into the wall? By conduction. So convection equal conduction. Here's convection. Here's conduction. Yeah, it's more complicated. It's not as easy as one, two, and three. It's more complicated. These aren't the only ones, okay. You want to get to the complicated ones? Spacecraft, oh yeah, there's no conduction, there's no convection. The boundary condition will be radiation. Okay, that's beyond the scope of our, of our course, okay? So we won't discuss that in this course, but there are other ones besides these four, just so you know. <clears throat> to solve this, what do I need? Okay, here's what I need. That's the first partial. I need one condition with time, okay. I need one initial condition, okay, great. Second partial with respect to X, ooh, I need two boundary conditions with X in them. Y, ooh, second partial, I need two boundary conditions with Y. So what do I need to solve this problem? I need four boundary conditions and one initial condition. Apply those to the governing partial differential equation, and what would I get? I would get a solution T as a function of X, Y, and time. That's what I want to do. I want a temperature distribution throughout the solid as a function of X, Y, and time. Okay, good stopping point today.